In the late 1930s, the US Navy's aircraft inventory was undergoing modernization, beginning to phase out their biplanes and bring in newer monowing aircraft. In 1935, a bid for a new fighter in this modernization program was put forth by the Navy, which Grumman and Brewster answered. Grumman, having developed the F-3F which was in service, would develop a logical, if conservative, bid, effectively being an up-engined biplane. Brewster, in contrast, would opt to go for a technologically bleeding-edged design, and while its early models would be well-liked by the Navy and Marines for its incredible handling, that merit was ruined by the addition of extra equipment, and thus weight, at the Navy's behest only after it had entered into service. But how does this involve the Corsair? Well, it serves to explain why the bid for a new fighter was put forth again only three years later in 1938. For in 1938, the Buffalo was being realized as subpar, the Wildcat was still in development, and China had been invaded by Japan, with Germany also eating both Czechoslovakia and Austria, causing a spike in world tensions and making the Navy a little anxious to have a new fighter in the fleet as soon as possible. So, in 1938, the Navy asked for a twin-engine or single-engine fighter with a top speed of, quote, maximum obtainable, a minimum landing speed of 70 miles per hour, and a range of 1,000 miles. Vought would be the only company to make a successful proposal to this contract, and the steps taken to accomplish it are easily visible in the Corsair's looks alone. Vought, in moves that would make Alexander Cartvelli proud, chose the R2800 Double Wasp as their engine of choice, giving it a two-speed supercharger to work at high altitude. A 13-foot, 4-inch, 3-bladed, later upgraded to 4-bladed propeller, would allow the engine maximum performance and would be the reason for the Corsair ending up with gull wings, a choice taken to avoid extremely long and thus weak landing gears. Built to be as sleek, aerodynamic, and as advanced as possible, the Corsair, while heavy, was fast, had good flight characteristics, and a lot of promise. Being so cutting-edge, however, it also had a lot of teething issues to figure out after its first flight in 1940. A combination of visibility issues, unusual stall and spin characteristics, and landing problems due to insufficient carrier facilities and cockpit layout would delay the Corsair getting carrier certified until 1944, when the British developed a landing procedure for it. Despite that, the Marines would take the Type-On in 1942 to replace their Buffaloes and Wildcats, as since they were operating from land bases primarily, they didn't care about the carrier landing issue and only saw the amazing performance it had on offer. In 1943, Corsairs would deploy to Guadalcanal and the Solomons, and soon got mixed in with the fight. Dueling against Japanese Navy Zeros, the Corsair was superior in all aspects, except slow speed turning and climbing, where the lighter Zero was optimized for. Tactics to avoid getting into a slow speed turn fight were thus developed and employed to absolutely devastating effect, racking up a 11 to 1 kill-loss ratio. Despite its success, it wouldn't progress as Japan in 1944 was on the defensive, and encountering a Japanese fighter soon became a more rare and rarer occurrence. Due to this change in the environment, the Corsair's role in the Marines and Navy would change as well. Being transitioned to a fighter-bomber role, its sheer lifting capacity, courtesy of its powerful engine, made it throwing bombs and launching rockets a natural talent of the Whistling Death, a nickname the Japanese soon attributed to the gull-winged guardian angel of the US Marine Infantry. It would fulfill this role until the war's end in 1945, and be kept on as a frontline fighter even as aircraft like the F-2H Banshee were entering service. Speaking of jets, Corsairs would fly in Korea as both escorts to Sky Raiders and fighter bombers, combating against North Korean and Chinese Yak-9s, LA-9s, and later MiG-15s. It is worth noting, for the record, that the beginning of the Korean War was very much still a war of propeller-driven aircraft, with jets a much rarer sight until the arrival of the F-86 Sabre and MiG-15 later in the war. Though heavily outmatched by the appearance of jets like the MiG-15 later on, Captain Jesse Fulmar in 1952 would manage to down a MiG and a Corsair before being shot down himself and later picked up. This allowed the Corsair to join the exclusive club of managing to shoot down a jet in a propeller-driven aircraft, sharing a seat alongside the earlier-covered Hawker Sea Fury. Its last war before worldwide retirement in 1979 would be, surprisingly, with Honduras, who operated them in the 1969 football war against El Salvador. This, coincidentally, would be the last conflict fought only with propeller-driven aircraft. America would retire the type in 1953, with production ending the same year, producing a total of 12,500 aircraft. Production managed to last until 1953, as France would choose the Corsair as their mainline carrier fighter post-war, and would purchase a fair number from Vought. In retirement, the Corsair was not quiet, as their high speeds and sleek lines made them a natural fit for air racing. 
Some major names in air racing would fly a variant of the Corsair produced limitedly by Goodyear called the F2 G1 Super Corsair, discernible by its bubble canopy and powered by a Wasp Major. Only two Super Corsairs exist today of the 11 produced and only one of which is still airworthy. As for normal Corsairs, 38 remain airworthy and are owned by museums or air racers, with 21 on display and 21 under restoration, with several of those restoration projects intent on being flown again.